Jack Derrida was one of the most influential but controversial and heavily criticised philosophers of the 20th century. He was labelled by many as a nihilist and as someone who, according to an open letter signed by 18 academics, does not meet accepted standards of clarity and rigour and attacks the values of reason and truth. In defence, I will start from the position that a large part of Derrida's unpopular legacy can be attributed to one overlooked and crucial premise. To understand Derrida and deconstruction, the approach to philosophy he inspired, it must be remembered what Derrida is criticising and why this makes him one of the most liberal, liberating and democratic proponents of our times. On the surface, his work was a deep analysis of grammatology, or writing, but the importance of his work and what unfolds from a critique of writing itself is a critical look at institutions. Derrida himself said that the idea behind deconstruction is to deconstruct the workings of strong nation-states with powerful immigration policies, to deconstruct the rhetoric of nationalism, the politics of place, the metaphysics of native land and native tongue, the idea is to disarm the bombs of identity that nation-states build to defend themselves against the stranger, against Jews and Arabs and immigrants. Political systems, political parties, power structures, bureaucracies, institutions are on the surface made up of buildings, websites, telephone numbers, people, documents, a network of things. But what they're really made up of is a tradition in their way of doing things, a shared language, a system of words and sentences that, bundled together, become the theory, the foundation, the goal, and the power of what that institution is. Derrida was writing at a time that was very different to today. Today, institutions have multiplied, fractured, democratized to an extent, and become much more complicated, not least because of mass media and the internet. But in the 1960s, the second biggest institution in the world, the US Army, was fighting a largely unjust and illegal war in Vietnam against a proxy for the second biggest institution, the Soviet Union, which had just come out of one of the most systematic and frightening abuses of power in human history. A terror that killed millions and stained the appeal that millions of people saw in another institution Marxism, not to mention Mao's Great Leap Forward, the Khmer Rouge, imperial wars, colonialism and neo-colonial abuses of power in the name of neoliberalism. All of these ideas and institutions are held together by theory and language, and to the proponents a convincing language that they thought revealed the truth of the world. Institutions are each respectively supported by a tradition of separate political philosophies, that each inspire books, essays, articles, networks of commentators, university lectures, supporters and detractors. The American Constitution was based on the political philosophy of John Locke. The right of sovereigns to rule around the world has been inspired by Hobbesian tradition going back to 1651 and theories about the divine right of kings before that. And of course the politics of almost 300 million people in the Soviet Union throughout most of the 20th century was inspired by the writings of one man. So it's important to remember all of this when reading Derrida. But what exactly does he say? Jack Derrida, born in 1930 and died in 2004, was the developer of deconstruction, a postmodern philosophy and method of criticising and deconstructing a text using just the text itself. Derrida argued that the history of philosophy was logocentric, that is, it presumed that there was some absolute truth that could be found through language. Derrida thought that this was fundamentally mistaken because of the undecidability of language, that words cannot be pinned down to a single definite meaning. Derrida has been called a post-structuralist because he engaged with the structuralism of Ferdinand de Saussure, who must be understood to understand what Derrida means when he says things like, monsters cannot be announced, one cannot say here are our monsters without immediately turning the monsters into pets. 
Saussure, teaching in Geneva at the beginning of the 20th century, said that meaning in language is produced by signs which have two sides, a signifier and a signified. The signifier is the word or image, sounds, writing a picture. The part that is sensed as an input by the brain, like the sound tree, the picture of a tree, or the written word tree. The signifier points to a signified, the concept of a tree. The signified is the idea. It cannot be a real tree because people refer to different trees when they say the word tree. It's the shared human idea of a tree. For Saussure, the signifier and the signified are united in the brain like two sides of a sheet of paper. He believed that what gives signs meaning is the differences between them. Cat, for example, means cat because it's not a bat, mat or gnat, and that it's given meaning because of its relationship with dog, mammal, four-legged animal, fur, pet, catwoman, batman, the list goes on. All of these are part of a structural network where signs all point towards each other to give each other meaning. Take a look at a dictionary. What do you see when you look up the definition of a word? Different words. And when you look up those, more words, until eventually you're back at the first word. Derrida took this idea and built upon it. He said that not only were signs dependent on each other for their meaning, but that other signs were always present within the meaning of a single sign by what he called their trace. Take pig, pink and big. When you say or think pig, other concepts, signs, signifieds and signifiers are literally present in the sign itself to define its meaning. The sign pig is also partly pink, big, small, dirty, farm, pork, ham and animal, among a thousand other things depending on the person. All of these concepts are neither present nor absent in the signifier pig, but are identifiable in the concept by their trace. Derrida wrote that the trace is not presence, but is rather the silicrum of a presence that dislocates, displaces, and refers beyond itself. The trace has, properly speaking, no place, for effacement belongs to the very structure of the trace. Trace is part of what Derrida termed difference, which means that meaning impossibly exists in the space between signs. He said that difference is the systematic play of differences, of the traces of differences, of the spacing by means by which elements are related to each other. This spacing is the simultaneously active and passive production of the intervals without which the full terms would not signify would not function. Derrida's fundamental point with all of these terms is that language is hugely subjective. Meaning differs from reader to reader, time to time, and so there cannot possibly be a shared truth that we can all access through one theory, philosophy, or institution. On top of this, Derrida thought that much of the tradition of Western philosophy was based upon binary oppositions where one term or concept is given primacy, said to be more natural, have more of the truth in it over the other. Right and left, male and female, inside and outside, high and low, speech and writing. Many writers, consciously or not, write as if there is a hierarchy where one term is presumed more fundamental than the other. Taking all of this into consideration, we can look at Derrida's most famous work, of grammatology, written in 1967, a notoriously difficult book. Remembering the necessity of institutional critique is important to understanding why he chooses to spend so much of the book on the French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau is one of the most important philosophers of modernity, and you can draw a lineage from Rousseau's thinking to not only the revolution that gave birth to the modern world, the French Revolution, but the thought of Freud, Marx, Kant, in fact almost every philosopher that came after him. Some draw a direct line between Rousseau and the totalitarian regimes of the 20th century. 
Rousseau's thought envisaged a political community that was closer to nature than the institutions he saw around him. Much of his writing is based on the idea that humanity has been corrupted by civil society. He said that when there is no effect, there is no cause to seek, but here the effect is certain, the depravity real, and our souls have been corrupted in proportion to the advancement of our sciences and arts towards perfection. For Rousseau, the most obvious example of this corruption is the written word. Speech, he says, expresses our thoughts almost instantly, always presently, always face to face, and the naturalness of speech has been corrupted by a dependency on writing, introducing distance and a barrier between two minds. Rousseau argues that writing embodies communities and institutions that are distant, unconnected, separate and thus unnatural. He says that writing, which seems as if it should fix language, is precisely what alters it. It changes not its words but its genius. It substitutes precision for expressiveness. Feelings are conveyed when one speaks and ideas when one writes. In writing, one is forced to take all of the words according to common exception. But he who speaks varies the meanings by the tones of his voices. He determines them as he pleases. Less constrained to be clear, he grants more to forcefulness, and it is not possible for a language one writes to keep for long the liveliness of one that is spoken. This immediately introduces a contradiction in Rousseau's thoughts that Rousseau was well aware of, that he constantly attacks writing, but has to write himself to express his position. Rousseau says that speech is natural and full in itself, but Derrida says that if that's so, adding writing to it reveals that it wasn't already full or complete. When you substitute speech for writing, you reveal a deficiency in speech, something it could not perform but had the potential to. So how, Derrida asks, could it be full and natural? Rousseau not only wrote political philosophy, but also the first modern autobiography, The Confessions. He clearly thought he needed the written word to justify his position. Rousseau thought that man before society, in a state of nature, was a species already in a perfect state. So why didn't things just stay the same? He said that culture, the arts and science, attacks nature from the outside. If this is so, again, how is nature complete? Derrida says that what Rousseau calls natural has the capacity for supplementation within it, making anything unnatural not unnatural at all. Rousseau creates an arbitrary binary between natural and unnatural to justify his entire political system. What appears as an unnatural substitute for something, a supplement, actually doesn't turn out to be artificial at all. No line can be drawn between natural and unnatural. When we think about some thing, that thing is inextricably connected to other things that aren't present to give the thing its identity. There is no logocentric moment of pure natural presence. The world is much too complicated. Saussure claimed that the link between signifier and signified was arbitrary. A tree could have easily been called something else, as it is in other languages. But Saussure also claimed that phonic signifiers, sounds and speech, had a more natural link to their signified concepts than written signifiers. This, Derrida points out, cannot possibly be true. If there is no natural link between signifier and signified, then speech cannot be naturally more important than writing. Of both Saussure and Rousseau's claim that language is independent of writing, Derrida says that such is the truth of nature and yet nature is affected from without by an overturning which modifies it in its interior, denatures it and obliges it to be separated from itself, nature denaturing itself, being separated from itself, 
naturally gathering its outside into its inside is catastrophe, a natural event that overthrows nature, a monstrosity, a natural deviation within nature. Rousseau and Saussure both call writing a tyranny, but where is the evil, one will perhaps ask? And what has been invested in the living word that makes such aggressions of writing intolerable? For Derrida then, everything Rousseau wrote was very natural, very real, and very much a part of Rousseau's existence, not a mediated version of it, hence his most famous line, there is no outside text. The point of Derrida's way of doing philosophy is to attack the authors, using only themselves, to deconstruct them from within. Derrida's philosophy is one for our times as it represents the scepticism of postmodernity. Represents how fewer and fewer people believe in the superlative power of institutions. That represents how nothing should be immune from assiduously detailed criticism. Derrida's style of writing can be obtuse and off-puttingly difficult, but there's a point to it. It's what he calls archa writing, a sort of philosophical writing that is aware of the difficulties he himself has shone a light on. And as long as you understand the basic tenets of Derrida's thought before going in, reading Derrida is less difficult and more a rewarding literary experience. I'm going to put a recommended reading list for Derrida in the description below, and if you'd like to support this channel, you can buy those books through those links, and I'll get a small commission, which would really help me out. You can also subscribe, like, and share this video, and if you're feeling really generous, you can support me on Patreon for as little as a dollar per video. See you next time.